Welcome back, everyone. And today we have a new member here almost at this podcast, a new guest. We have the drummer of the amazing, amazing, amazing melodic death metal band from Brazil, Luana D'Ametto. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Just uh, came home from a few gigs. That looks actually pretty nice, the home you have. I was about to ask you, what a nice background. Very traditional. I oh, like thank it. You. Thanks. It's my antique um, uh, taste for decor. <laughs> it's crazy that you say that because I, I just on the way home today, I pass another street with so many stores with antique stuff. And I cannot believe this is still like and it's so popular. I mean, of course, it's antique, but it's more popular than ever. I love this. I think it really is a cool niche and people should uh, check it out more because once you go into it, it's a really cool, detailed uh, yeah, area. Very interesting. Yeah, definitely one of my passions. You just said you came back from a few gigs. Man, you are touring. You have so much. This is the thing about your band. I, when I did you know, a lot of research, I realized how much you released already. You know, we're going to talk about this, but you started the band three years ago, four years ago. It actually says 2019, but the first song was released 2020. And of course, that is after you had the break and, and you left Nervosa. But um, I mean, especially at the time, 2020 pandemic, you know, everything started. You were working so much, you guys in the band, and you released, I think, six or seven singles until now already. That's crazy. In two records. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a new band, but we're trying to work as hard as possible to like kind of move forward with the band like as fast as we can, I would say. Like not that we're rushing or anything, but um, also like, we don't want to be waiting for like, I don't know, eight years to have like like a catalog or a menu for, of <laughs> songs and singles for people to choose from. So we're trying our best with releasing as many videos as we can with the budget we have and, you know, yeah, releasing stuff that people can just consume easier. It's definitely working out for you, for sure. And it's interesting because this is another topic everybody talks about nowadays. Of course, we have bands like Tool that release maybe a record every uh, 500 million years. But then you have now other bands that go for this stand, you know, standalone singles and videos, releasing them every couple of months. I think this is an interesting area. I think you guys did it pretty well, pretty perfect. That's also why we're here right now talking. But I think it's interesting because we need to adapt to the technology, which is just growing faster and faster. Everything is just shorter and faster. And then unfortunately, it's almost like done. You know, people are not really, of course, there's still, you know, the amount of people that like to go to a record store and have a record. Of course, I have your record here, beautiful record. We're going to talk about this. But unfortunately, the other generations, they just like to consume everything right now, right here and done. You know, so it's it's always mm -hmm. a tricky, tricky, um, yeah, tricky decision to make. I don't know how it was for you as a band who made the decisions, but was that any, was it in any given time, was that a topic that you had to you know, talk through with, with the rest of the band, like, hey, let's do it the way we know how to do it, or should we change it? Was that any topic for you? Uh, no, I think we all pretty much agree that we should be releasing stuff here and there and not just letting the band get into... I, I mean, we don't want people to completely forget about the band. It's also, like I said, it's a new band, so we, we can't really do that. If we just, mm -hmm. like, stop releasing stuff for a long while, I think people would just start forgetting about us or at least this is the impression that I have because you know like we we're still growing right now and um reaching new things that we didn't before in our careers so if right now we would take too much time to be releasing stuff or to really put on videos online which is something that people consume the most nowadays it would be kind of bad yeah. for us and crypto is our main job like I, we all get all our money from for living from this band so um we got to keep up with stuff it, it, stuff like as much as artistic it is to have a band it, it's also like a company or a business to be to be run if i can say like that i have my english <laughs> so that's failing me but yeah so um it is it is tricky to be writing music all the time to like yeah. release every two or three years 
Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's something we're going to do. So we push ourselves. Maybe in the future, if we become like a bigger band or anything like that, then we can have like more time and be more patient about releasing stuff and have long, longer periods of time to think about stuff. But right now, it's just like working as much as we can to make this better for us in the future. I totally understand. That was one of my next questions. Very interesting that you mentioned the business side of of being in a band or or an artist in general, because many people don't know this. You left a very successful band and then you basically had to start from scratch. Now, if you keep in mind everybody out there, because I had to do the same with one startup, not in the music scene, something else. I did exactly the same. It is, yeah, it is very, very, it can be very scary to start from scratch and leave everything behind, especially if you depend on the money and the cash flow and everything else, because it is a business, right? You know, you're not just doing it as a joke. It is, of course, a business. So my question for you, you and Fernanda, when you took that step, how did you feel? You, I mean, at one point, and that's my opinion, in your heart, you knew you need to do something else and, you know, create the music that you really want to do, obviously. But on the other hand, it was a tough decision to make, right? It was very scary, like extremely yeah. scary. At the time, I just felt terrible because um, yeah. I knew that I would like to leave the band. It was about time to do so. We all knew about that. Like even, even our other guitarists knew we were about to leave the band or something, you know. Everyone just felt like it. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, like like you mentioned, like I mentioned, it's my main job. And I was yeah. getting this money from the band to be playing live and like for shows that I was playing and that's just my all my income you know and I knew Nervosa mm-hmm. was at a certain level already that I could get money enough to leave from it and I was just really scared that I was going to leave my only income and uh get into this new band that no one knew about that didn't have any reputation or anything going for us really and just I didn't know if maybe I I was like getting ready to maybe accept the fact that if crypto didn't go well like fast I I was gonna have to just uh, find a regular job in in Mm -hmm. my CD which was something Mm -hmm. I have never done before Uh, I always worked with music so it would be pretty much my first time and it would be kind of crushing after you played so much live and toured so much around the world i mean if i had started like that maybe it wouldn't but i started with being a death metal drummer already so th- yeah. that would be so weird and uh gladly crypto worked very fast and napalm kind of took us and from there we were able to like already start having some income to like leave from crypto as well but at the beginning we were kind of leaving off our savings that we we've done with the previous band to like yeah. also try to push crypto and pay for the stuff that, that crypto needed to start the band because it's a lot of mm-hmm. there's a lot of paperwork at the beginning you know band name these these and that, that you have to do and pay for so yeah we lived off savings for a while and gladly crypto worked fast and now we're fine but it's a uh, very scary to start from scratch when you depend yeah. on it. Yeah, especially mentally. I mean, uh, probably days and nights when you cannot sleep. When is it going to happen? You know, is it going to happen? Yeah, it's a very tricky and very scary situation. But, you know, all the best to you. Congratulations, because you made it. And when it comes to the metal, let's say death metal scene, I mean, we have, of course, those giants out there, Cannibal Corpse and a few others, of course. But then there are also many, many bands that people don't actually know. You know, and that's always one thing that I'm thinking like, yeah, it is still a subgenre because there's so much talent out there, but it's, it is very, very hard to be notified, to be noticed, unfortunately, especially in those genres. So you made it the right way. Congratulations for this. And you released the second record just a couple of weeks ago, and I have it here in my hand. It's a very, very cool record, everyone. I'm, I'm serious about this because... And that's why I started to talk about death metal. This it, this record has an intro and an outro. And I thought this is interesting because many records don't have it nowadays anymore. So in my head, in my opinion, because it says, of course, the title is, of course, Shades of Sorrow. And the first single, very interesting, by the way, was, of course, something that is considered, you know, the phoenix rising from the ash. And I thought, okay, 
Maybe it has to do with the fact that they start from the beginning and they left the band and now they're going to show everybody, you know, what they have. Because I remember back then from, from the Ashes when it came out, the first single and video, I think that was 2020, right? Uh, I think so, one. yeah. yeah I'm not had, even sure. I think that was 2020, three years ago, because okay. Napalm Record had you right there. And I, and I thought, man, who had the idea for the video? Because the video was so powerful. Everything was powerful, not just the music. But actually, your faces, everybody, how they, you perform, I love that. I love when I see the energy on everyone's face, and it's, and it's uh, sincere. Who had the idea for that music video? Do you remember that? Well, like, um, I try to help as much as I can with everything that has to do with image for the band, because previous to being just a drummer, I was mm -hmm. a, a drummer and a graphic designer. So I try to put ideas together and, and, and stuff. I remember me having the idea and the wish of having mm -hmm. a music video in, in which we could be buried. Like it was always a dream of mine to be able to be buried <laughs> in a video or <laughs> a clip or whatever. I just wanted like to dig a grave and yeah. have coffins involved and fire and death and, you know, just the, the cool <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And then we started talking about, talking around this idea of having graves and coffins and, and fire. And I was just like, you know, what would be cool if we like after like mm -hmm. burying ourselves, which is already pretty cool. If we like set fire to the coffin, which is like an extra, just, just an extra. <laughs> and everyone's like, Oh, cool. We can have like an explosion and blah, blah. blah. And then uh, the director came with the idea of us actually dragging the coffin with the chains as well mm -hmm. to the forest. So it it was like I it, it started with this idea of having the coffins and, and the graves and then I guess everyone started to add stuff to it. Like what yeah. if we did this and what if we did that? And then the director was kinda helping to create this story. But yeah, it was uh, it was a little bit of everyone's work around one <laughs> central idea of having graves. <laughs> Very interesting. I like that when everybody's involved, that, that makes everything more artistic. I really like this because some, sometimes, you know, those bands, there's one person who wants to do everything and then the rest is just like, yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I like that. I like that, that everybody's involved. Man, what a powerhouse your band is. I mean, really, when I saw a few of your live performances. That is always for me the, the, you know, the, the key factor of if you want to review a band, you know, because the studio records or the studio versions, you can have so many takes until it sounds good or until you have what you want to have. And that's, of course, normal and fine. But when you see a band live performing, that's the one take. You know, that's just how are they performing? Are they really meaning what they do? Do they like it? Do, are they not liking it? And uh, your band, unbelievable. Especially you, how fast you were playing. I love that. That was perfect because I was also a drummer. So I, I, I love that. That was perfect. Oh, okay. And I think, I was just going to say, I think we're more or less the same generation. So what I thought was interesting is even though you're playing almost traditional death metal, you're not really playing traditional death metal. There's still this very groovy element, which I really like. And I really miss with uh, uh, some other bands like Strict, Death Metal, Blast Beat uh, uh, bands. Sometimes I miss it with them. With you, I have that. And that's something that I thought Definitely made the last record very attractive to me, but of course, also the other record before, Echoes of the Soul, very cool. I mean, people normally don't like when, when, unfortunately in metal, it is like it is, people are very strict and they don't like when you almost mix genres. Now you're not mixing rap in, in death metal, but you still have that influence. So of course, I'm asking you as a drummer as well, who was, if you have a main influence, who was your top three drummers that you look up to or you're still listen to? Uh, I would say my top three drummers is uh, oh, so difficult. <laughs> it's um Eloy Casagrande, mm. uh James Stewart, and uh the third one. I would say it's a uh, Achilles Priester. Yeah, interesting um, ones. That, you know that there is like varied reasons why it's so mixed up in the album. It's just because. I always try to explain that like it's the only band this is the only band I have and I'm currently not doing sessions or anything. So yeah. this is my only artistic outcome to play my instrument. 
and yeah. I try to put as many things as I can that I also like have to practice and that are mm-hmm. out of my comfort zone so I can learn a little bit of everything while I'm still playing with crypto uh otherwise I would if if I wanted to just like go death metal and blast beats and fast speed and stuff I could but then yeah. I wouldn't like have any other opportunity in my life to be playing any groovy stuff because I don't have an event to be putting those things on. So like, I think that's a big reason to explain why it's so diversified <laughs> with the drum lines as well. I love it. I think that's exactly the the right reason. I would have done the same. I really like it. I think also it just gives you that 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 tempo. I mean, it's not too fast. It is fast, but then you know, you slow down at one point. I love it. It's just good to happen, good to to enjoy life. Very, very good. But then again, how was it for you? I know we talked with many other bands about this. COVID hit, and that's exactly the time that you left the one band. So then even more of a of a pressure on you. And you you still, you guys, you girls actually, you could still do it. You, unbelievable. Respect for you. Respect to you and everyone else doing this. But I was talking to Andreas Kissa the other day from Sepatura, of course. I could not believe it how many bands actually come from Sao Paulo and Brazil. What is it that creates so many energetic and powerful artists in especially South America? I mean, I'm from Madrid, Spain, actually, and I know Spanish people are mm-hmm. crazy. You know, we like music and South American as well. But there's just something about Brazilian music. You know, of course, we know Sepatura roots, bloody roots. But there's something in the roots of being a Brazilian musician. How was it for you growing up in the in the metal scene back then? Uh, the metal scene where I live is very, very small and like everyone knows everyone because I live, um, Fernanda lives in Sao Paulo and Jessica lives around Sao Paulo, but I just live, um, far. <laughs> I live in the South, very far from everyone in a small city close to like, I'm closer to Argentina and Uruguay than I would be from my bandmates even. So wow. I'm definitely in the South South. So here it's, uh, <laughs> we, we barely have a metal scene where I live. People barely know metal. Like, there's like me and a few other people in my city that wow. even like know metal. <laughs> but, um, I would say that growing up just in Brazil, wh- whatever you are in Brazil, mm-hmm. um, it is very different from just being in the US. I would say North America in general, like yeah. Europe. Uh, I would assume that people like I, I didn't leave there, but um, I would assume that people have more opportunities over there because of the general income. Like I know there are poor people in there as well, of course, definitely. But uh, in general, it's just like things are just harder in South America. I would say like things don't we don't get things in here. Like um, it's even difficult to find good music stores. Uh, yeah. not very common. We don't have like these gigantic music stores with everything, and you can go there and test it and blah blah. Like uh, I never had it where I live here. We don't have like a single music store, and wow. everything I ever bought was online, and everything is extremely overpriced because we live in South America and things come from other places. And till it comes here, it's all like taxed and shit, and yeah. we get less money than we should. So like things are more expensive, and we get less. So. I would say for a South American band, it's just like a huge deal to have even the gear and to have the time and the money to be able to like go and record an album and try to show up your band to see if it's going to work, which is something that maybe for some people around the world is just like a hobby or just like, I'm going to do this band and and fulfill my artistic needs. And or if it doesn't go well, then fine, I will do what I can with the band when I have time. I would say that it's completely different in South America. It's just like sometimes if it doesn't work, people would like just completely give up on their bands because like who has the time and the money to be doing that? You know, like it's an extra yeah. for sure. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that definitely pushes us to have angrier bands and just like stuff like Sepultura, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah, but it also gives you the power that you need, you know, the strength and the power to really do it and make it, you know, you don't give up. You say, you know, I want to have it, you know, yeah. that is cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, the strength comes from that, I think. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. Uh, I think we grab the opportunities that we have um, with much more strongly than we would if we weren't from here. Like yeah. we, we are really taking the opportunities because we know that they sometimes most of the times won't come twice yeah 
I love it. I love it. That's, you know, because I was talking to a few other bands from South America and most of them said exactly the same, more or less. You know, you have a lot of struggles Mm -hmm. going through everything that you have to go through. But then once you make it, that's why the, those live performances are just so good, you know. You, and especially, you know what's interesting? The bands from the 80s, 90s, and maybe, maybe early 2000s are still the best live bands, in my opinion. You know, so many new bands that that had it, it maybe a bit easier becoming an artist. Oh, I don't know. Their life, they're not as good, you know. That's, that's, that's another thing. But okay, let's talk about this new record because you released already three singles. The record came out a couple of weeks ago, but three singles already. We're going to check out one single together, The Other Side of Anger, which is, of course, now the bridge to what we just talked about. Because maybe now, maybe there's some love in the air now that you have the anger growing up, you know, and like ah, fighting your way through. I loved it, by the way. We're going to check this song out. But before that, you release another, um, another single called Trial of Traitors. That was a yep. very interesting, very interesting song. I thought I like this a lot. That was good, man. Who had the idea yeah. of who had the idea of of releasing this song? Did you all sit together and say, you know, it's time for that to be, you know, that song to be the next single? We all we all talk about together in like a meeting which songs are gonna be the singles. We always try to like diversify with uh, releasing at least one of the more melodic songs one of the more aggressive fast oriented songs and then from that then we can like choose by taste like i like this and i think this would work but uh, we we try that the first two are like one Mm -hmm. more melodic and not one not so melodic because we know that that splits a lot of our audience like some Mm -hmm. people don't like the the melody very much and some people are just all into the melody so we we try to give a little bit of both to get our old people (laughs) I liked it. We're going to find out what everybody thinks of the next song. So everybody, we're going to check out now the latest single, The Other Side of Anger by Crypta from the record Shades of Sorrow, which is a pretty good record. Uh, Very cool artwork as well. I have the artwork cover here and the lyrics. I like that. Very old school, but at the same time with a fresh touch. I like that. So let's head over. All right, everyone. So here we go now. Crypta, Lot of Ruins, the official music video. Let's go. Yeah, this is the part that I meant. Very, very nice. Another great video, right? <laughs> I mean, it was fun to, fun to str- strangle someone. <laughs> Yeah, this part is so groovy, I love it. Yeah, I'm playing with my feet all the time. <laughs> Yeah. 
beautiful. Let's go. Fernanda's voice is great. Yeah. I love this voice. Great bridge. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, these are the parts that I was talking about earlier. Perfect for live performance. Very good live performing songs. Yeah, and it's also very easy to play that part, so we can definitely go hard on performance. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's continue. Perfect. I know you have to go, I think, in 10 seconds or something. So I'm going to finish this video now, unfortunately. Everybody, right. there you go. You saw that. A lot of ruins, man. A lot of music. I think that's a better name for you as a band because this was perfect. And we talked about those, you know, groovy parts, great bridges, great, still melodic, very melodic, actually. And when it comes to, because you, of course, are the drummer, but when it comes to Fernanda's voice, what I really appreciate is the fact that it's not too loud. Sometimes death metal vo you know, vocals are overpowering the rest of the music and a lot of things are getting lost. For you, in your case, perfect mix, perfect structure, perfect songwriting. And I cannot wait to see you live. I really cannot wait to see those oh. songs live and you perform live. Thanks, man. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. I hope to see you again. Maybe we have a bit more time. Everybody, make sure. Here we go. Shades of Sorrow. Brand new record. Bam, bada, bam, bam, bam. There you have it. Get yourself a coffee. Uh, coffee as well. Coffee and coffee. <laughs> and we see you next time. Thank you so much, Rana. Thank All you right, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.